The Octarine Dream, a podcast exploring the meaning of ecology, spirit, and human relationship. From Southwestern Australia, I'm your host, Byron Joel. G'day mob, welcome back to the Octarine Tree podcast. Today I was chatting with Australian archaeologist and anthropologist Scott Kane. I first came across Scott Kane on the ABC series First Footprints, which explored the natural history and culture of Indigenous Australians. Scott was featured in the documentary series and was then asked to write an associated text to the series of the same name, First Footprints. Excellent book, really great book. As we discuss, it's different from your average textbook. It really, on top of the scientific, anthropological, archeological evidence that he cites, he adds a a great uh, narrative element to it. And Scott's spent 40 odd years in the field on country with Indigenous Australians and has a a really interesting take on the whole subject. A dear friend of mine who works in native title was around at my place and he saw the book and he said, oh, I work with Scott, which I was stoked to hear. And then he introduced me to him and uh, then we had today's chat. I'm extremely interested in Indigenous cultures and in particular Indigenous Australian cultures It can be tricky sometimes to discuss indigenous cultures, especially in today's political climate. One can very easily and uh, unintentionally say things that are a little less uh, sensitive perhaps than should be. I don't think we've done so in this chat, but it's worth stating that everything that I discuss on these topics is done so in a respectful manner and uh, as respectfully as I can possibly be. We, Scott, myself, I can only really speak for myself, but I'm not speaking for them. It's my experience of them and their culture that I'm I'm discussing, and I don't claim to have any inside understanding of their cultures. In saying that, though, I do believe we are all Indigenous to this planet, and even those of us who were born and raised inside the industrial culture, we still, we're human and we have it all inside of ourselves, the capacity for it, the instincts for, for all of it, the deepest parts of ourselves and our capacities. Albeit latent, they are still within us. And I think it's an extremely important part of our return to a regenerative way of life and a deeper communing with the world around us, with nature, with our immediate environment, with ourselves, with spirit and with country. I have invited members of the Australian, Southwest Australian Indigenous community to join me on the Octarine Tree podcast and hopefully that will happen sometime in the uh, near future. So anyway, without further ado, as I say every episode it seems, anthropologist, archaeologist Scott Kane. Scott Kane, anthropologist, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Octarine Tree podcast. How are you today? I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We'll go with good at the moment. We were just chatting before I hit record a little bit about your entree to anthropology. And so you, you were saying that you actually started training in archaeology first. That's right. And that gave you a good grasp of the forensics and the science-based mindset. Is that correct? Yeah. But as it turned out, and as my career and, and in fact, Aboriginal studies more generally evolved mm. and Aboriginal you know, political issues evolved, it turned out to be a really useful thing because in, in, in the study of archaeology, you're often interested in the relationship between people and the land they live on and you look for archaeological clues as to who they were and what they did. Mm. So you end up with kind of like yeah, quite a scientific, empirically-based approach. And when when... You know, Aboriginal politics emerged into the field of native title. That's exactly the relationship that people were looking for. So you transfer those skills, that evidence-based approach to the to the native title, and it kind of works well. Right. It makes for sound evidence, which makes for sound determinations of native title. The court likes rock-solid evidence rather than appear yeah. unfounded. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you completed an undergrad in archaeology before going to Anthrop, or did you just? No, my no, no, my um my trajectory was actually unusual. I, I was a surfer. I grew up in Tasmania, and I was sort of interested in. Well, coastal midlands, and you've got a few of them around your yeah. coast, but maybe not as many as in Tasmania, but there's lots in Tasmania, and they're huge. So I was a bit obsessed with them, so I had an amateur interest in it. And I met an academic in the course of growing up, you know, like when I was 20 or so, and he said, you should go to university and study it. So so I, I did that. I actually was trained to be a teacher because as a surfer, that was the best job I could think of to give me a lot of time to surf. Right. And, um, and, and, and so I, I finished that, and then I went to university. Okay. And and um, so I, I kind of went in late, and, the, and, and, and then at this Australian National University, you could do a qualifying degree to see if you're up for it. Right. And and I did that, and I was old enough then to do it quite well. And I went actually straight into a PhD. I only did a year of undergraduate study. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. I wish that still existed. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Oh, well, for, for mature A students, it, it doesn't exist now, but it did then. It was called a master's qualifier, and you literally went in to see if you could qualify. Yeah. And if you got over 86%, then you'd qualify. And and because I was older and I was pretty passionate about it, like you might be yourself, Yeah. I um, I loved it. So I, I qualified well, and they kind of went, ah, oh, you got But I was a bit intellectually immature, really, to, to actually take on a PhD. I managed, but it was, it was difficult. Having that maturity behind you does help. I'd love to do that. I'd love to go in and, and show my, you know, get recognition of prior learning as it as it relates to the field and stuff. I don't think they do that anymore. No, no, they don't. Being a surf, have you been to Southwest WA? I know you've been all over the place everywhere. Else. Oh, look, a bit. No, yeah, I've surfed a lot around the, the shot, but not much actually in the Southwest. I'm a bit of an old-fashioned surfer that, likes no crowds <laughs> then you get a lot of wind and you get a lot of crowds so you do well i lived in margaret river for 10 odd years and that's a pretty yeah. fa- famous surf spot oh yeah yeah you know the devil's lair site it's in southwest australia yeah yeah that's a pretty interesting site the, the caves around southwest are amazing yeah i've never been to them yeah a whole lot of caves with a whole lot of old sinkholes full of megafauna you know because Southwestern Australia had its, you know, the thylacine and the Tassie devil and the giant kangaroos mm-hmm. and the diprotodons and my favourite guy, the thylacoleo. Mm-hmm. It's not terribly uncommon that you'll get amateur cave explorers. Speleologists. Speleologists stumbling yeah. across a uh, unknown cave or sinkhole and discovering, you know, megafauna remains. It's not that uncommon. It's a really interesting spot. Well, it's more likely that they'll discover it. You know, as I'm just saying, the best sites are discovered by farmers' wives. That area is absolutely peppered with sinkholes and caves. Yeah. For every one that's been registered and named, there's a dozen that haven't. Yeah, yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. So first footprints is how I discovered your work. I watched oh, yeah. the ABC series and then a friend of mine actually, not knowing that I'd watched it, bought your book for me. And I read that. So which came first? Did you write the book based off the series or was it the other way around? Did you assist in the structuring of the series? How did... No. I mean, look, my whole career has been sort of uh, almost like an accident, really. And that was the same. I mean, I was actually heading off to South America with my family for a, a year and they rang like literally three weeks before I was going and said, oh, can we go down to the, on the talk about big caves and the caves on the Nullarbor Plain? And yeah. I'd worked out there 20 years ago and I'm going like, no, nah, man, I'm heading off in a few weeks and... And I've been out there for 20 years, but, you know, please, if you insist. So I just went out there and we did that footage that you see on the thing, mm-hmm. which is only 10 minutes. It took 18 hours of filming, for goodness sake, and started the caves. Yeah. And that was it. And then when they, they, I went off and I came back and I was finishing the documentary at that point. And, um, and they just rang and said, oh, would I write a book to go with it? And I didn't even have a plan in my head to write a book. Right. But because they'd asked, and because I'd also left archaeology and I'd been doing anthropology for 20 years, it was kind of, I kind of in my own head went, yeah, why not? You know, stuff it, I'll have a go. And yeah. I had a four month deadline and I just wrote what, exactly what I wanted to write. Right. And that was first footprints. Literally a first draft is what you're reading. I mean, the editors at Alan Hunwell went through it, made some editorial changes, and out it came. So I had no involvement other than just a participation in the filming. It's an excellent book. I love it. Yeah, well, that's, that's really nice of you. It seems to sell quite well. And I think. I did try because I was not. This will sound, and I won't sound odd at all. But because I'm not in, because I work as an independent consultant, I'm not embedded in the university system, so I paid l- less attention to the scholars 
than actually what they actually found. So if you note in the book, everything's footnoted to the people who did it, but the story is about Aboriginal life and the Aboriginal story. I tried to write a sort of social history. Yeah, and it is a refreshing read. That came across. One, you're a good writer. Like, if you did that all by yourself, just your turn of phrase is really quite elegant. On top of that, the narrative that you paint out and what you use to back it up is actually, I don't know, it, has, it had a kind of refreshing, some kind of difference to it than your average textbook that you might read on the subject it's, it's really engaging yeah well that's really nice to say and i did try to humanize it and because i spent most of my life in the bush in the field i wanted to give it a landscape kind of human context yeah and forget the science and forget the debate between the scientists what's the story and look just i don't know who your audience is you know oh it's one guy yeah yeah like, you know, i was a bit dyslexic at school and i was a delinquent sort of kid and I was, I never, I didn't read a book till I was about 20. So it's really weird that I sort of seem to be able to slightly write. And I don't know how that's coming oh, back. Mate, mate, not slightly. You can write. When I read it, I didn't picture someone as rough around the edges as you when I was reading it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just a surfer. You captured the human aspect of it. And in particular, what I love the most, because my interest, well, I like the whole story, but I am particularly enthralled with the human colonising of Sahul. Yeah, that's exactly the story. And that moment, to me, it's so fascinating. There's this island continent that's been separated for 40 plus million years. Mm. And there's this moment where I'm probably exaggerating the gravity, but Michelangelo's God touching Adam's finger in that painting when human... Yeah, yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's completely exaggerating. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, but, but you're right. I, I like the romance as well, I, and I have that romantic. So I can, for example, when I surf through Indonesia, and I know when I'm down in Timor, when in the in the in the, in the, the end of the sort of winter season, surfing there, mm. and there are bushfires in northern Australia, you can smell Australia. So the people living there, Timor is an Australian island, geologically speaking. It's a Sahulian island. Yeah, yeah, and he, and, he, and when you're there. Exactly, it feels like northern Australia. But if you were living there, you know, 70,000 years ago, you would know there was something further down. Mm. You would know because you'd smell it. You'd smell it and the shoreline would be however many kilometres closer due to the um, lower sea levels at the glacial minimum. It, was, it still was always about 80. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was still a fair hike, but you're exactly right. So I've been working up in Arnhem Land a bit in the last sort of five years or so, and they have the sort of opposite experience. They have the sort of the, basically a spiritual land of the dead as part of their mythology, but it's based on the fact that every season they have things like coconuts, bamboo, bits and pieces of wooden boats washing in on the shore on the northern Australia ah. from Indonesia. So, again, for the 70,000 years of human occupation, they've had sort of Flotsam and Jetson of other yep. communities way to the north, which are unexplained. So there's always a sort of sense of communication and belonging in a really weird kind of spatial way. Are many origin stories like Genesis stories, do they point to the north? Is there like an instinctual and narrative and scientific understanding of the traditional stories of having come down from the north? Is that common? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, in Arnhem Land, they, they're, they're really strong stories of women that come and the, and the spiritual being has these dilly bags full of children. Yeah. She arrives in Australia and travels and puts the children in the landscape. That's really... I remember that image, the cave painting. Yeah. But, and, but no, that, that's still held, actively held. And it, and it combines with this notion up there of rain as sort of the psychic element, which the spirits, when you die, go to the sky, they form in clouds. When you hear the, see the, the great big sort of wet season storms which come from the north, that's the spirits returning from the land of the dead, which is kind of notionally Indonesia. So, it's, yeah, there's a strong narrative. So to back to yeah. Timor and Flores, so they're actually on the Sahuli and the Australian mm. plate. They are geologically Australian islands. Um, mm. they are now, of course, they're islands separated from the mainland. I'm not sure if they were ever part of the mainland. You couldn't walk from Timor and Flores. No, I never could. It is on the Australian side of the Wallace line. Yep. Professor Bert Roberts, who discovered, or his team discovered the Homo floresiensis in the 2000s. And yeah, Michael Moore. On the island of Flores. Yeah. He's suggested that it might be possible that a non-sapiens hominin species managed to cross the Wallace line more than cross the Wallace line because we know that the diminutive little hobbits the Homo floresiensis Flores is on the Australian side of the Wallace line we were always told that no hominin prior to Homo sapiens in the form of the original indigenous Australians 
managed to reach the Australian mainland because they couldn't because of the Wallace line. We now know that a hominin species at least, Homo floresiensis, did so. And Roberts has suggested that it is scientifically plausible that uh, a non-sapien species not just crossed the Wallace line, but actually landed on the Australian mainland prior to sapiens. Would you agree with that? Not that it did happen necessarily, but that it's at least scientifically plausible that it occurred, even if we don't have a fossil record? Yeah, yeah, hypothetically. I mean, I think Homo erectus, I mean, Homo erectus got to Java half a million years ago. He was there for a long time. I mean, animals, I mean, it's animals. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and I mean, rats and, and elephants crossed the Wallace line. Mm, the Stegodon. So I, I don't think there's any reason why that could not have, might not have happened, for sure. Yeah. Is there anything in anthropology or paleo anthropology, archaeology in the record that suggests that might have occurred, or is that pure speculation? No, no, it's just speculation. Okay. In the earliest dates, even I mean, I took a, I didn't care because I believed the balance of the evidence. It's something you've got to do when you're doing no tally. You've actually got to form an opinion at some point, and so I took yeah. the step in first footprints of accepting uh, Birch dates. Yeah. With Mike Smith and Reese Jones up in the north, which were, you know, one in three chance of it being sort of 55 or 72, and somewhere in the middle was 65,000 years ago. So, I mean, I can mm. fully accept that as a, at the moment, the firmest date for colon first colonization of Australia. Uh, we haven't got anything on that that's reliable. Right. But you're, you're quite right. Possibilities there. That's the journey, isn't it? I mean, it's so interesting. Yeah, well, to me, it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if one day something shows up in the fossil record, if there was some tiny population of yeah, God yeah. knows what. I mean, if Floresiensis could cross the Wallace line, and it's now speculated that it wasn't just a Homo erectus that became endwarfed due to an island thing. Yeah. But the cladistic suggests that there's something very strange going on. So the diversity of the hominin family tree keeps just bushing out and bushing out and it, it becomes yeah. an ever more interesting story. So anything could have happened. Yeah, like, so look, I don't know if you've read this in like, two books by a guy called Steve Webb. He's, a, he's just a retired professor of history in, up in Bond University and he's written extensively about both things. He's a really good uh, paleontologist, bone specialist. Okay. And he's written one book on the boat people and a more recent one, which I've got on my shelf, which I can't see now to remind you the title. But that, the latter book is all about exactly that. He thinks that people were here 120,000 years ago. He thinks the evidence firm close to that. So you, you'd enjoy reading that problem. Steve Webb. Oh, I've just taken that down. Yeah. Steve Webb, yeah. That, I'm going to read the proverbial shit out of that. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Lake Mungo, is Mungo still the oldest conclusive remains that we have on the continent? No, we, they're, they're, still, they're still the oldest sort of decorated remains in the sense of the oldest evidence on Earth of human beings expressing it. A knowledge of or empathy with the afterlife because they treated the bones before burial. Right. So that's 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 its significance. But but yeah, the oldest site is still the, the one that Bert and Mike Smith and Reese Jones dated up in the north in, in Kakadu. Yeah. Five thousand. And the site known as Moy Hill in Warner Bowl, Victoria. Are you familiar with that? Dr. John Sherwood from Deakin Uni. They found these shell middens. Is that recent? It wasn't that long ago, yeah. yeah. I think it was like last... And I'm not. Yeah, I remember having a glance. They suggest that these shell middens are dated to 120,000 years before present. That's right. I remember reading that. But there was no tools associated with the site. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. When that came out, it was, you know, there were the articles here and there and yeah. a little bit of a media rush, nothing huge. Since then, I haven't heard much from it. So I'm, gonna, I'm finally and under maybe for now. So you, you haven't heard much from it? No, nothing else. No, no I know what you know. Okay. I mean, the sea level was high 120,000 years ago, similar to, to, to today. So that's about all I know. It could easily just be a, a drift of shells. Right. Okay. All right. I'm still holding out that it was aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Like you've got, you need, you know, you, you need the evidence. You, you need the evidence. You, you need an artifact or, of course, or a, a cut shell or something. It's hard enough finding evidence for people exploding megafauna. It's almost impossible to believe they didn't exploit them. But evidence is hard to come by. What do you mean by exploit? Hunt megafauna. Did you see an article recently that came out that suggested that the Australian megafauna extinction coincided with a pole shift, a reversal of the Earth's magnetic poles in around 42,000 BC? No, I, the only last one I knew of was about 45,000 years ago. So I guess there's a correlation there. But because um, they've got some of that stuff from the 
halves that they've dated in in that Mungo area. The, a pole, the reversal, yeah, like a right. north was somewhere where southeast is now. But I didn't know the correlation there with megafauna. I haven't read that on this stuff much for a while. This is brand spanking new. Yeah. And as an amateur, I never know how close I am to the uh, current academic consensus. Sure. I just don't know my radar for that. I don't know whether I'm way off in fairyland or I'm actually kind of at least keeping up to the broad story. I reckon you're keeping up. And look, in my experience, the academic consensus is kind of never consensus. Like there's always a division, dichotomistic view about, right. in my view, that people would have hunted them and that hunting pressure pushed them to extinction. And other people say, no, it was environmental yeah. induced because Aboriginal people were in touch with the environment and wouldn't, wouldn't have done that. But I mean, I've lived out in the desert for 40 years and people hunt pretty hard. I don't think any human lineage is uh, infallible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Australian megafauna story, again, I find fascinating when I'm out walking around country. Down in the southwest, there's petroglyphs of the mirang, that big bloody duck emu bird, mm -hmm. gimme or whatever it's called. And yeah. they found, uh, you know, mainland Tassie devil teeth. Mm -hmm. They had a larger subspecies down there. And that was actually dated to only 600 years ago. So mm -hmm. that's a bit of a, a mm -hmm. different, it was a different universe, like 50,000 years ago plus in Australia. I've got a particular interest in the botany. There was a climatic shift that occurred in Australia and a drying out that occurred. And prior to, say, 50,000 years ago, Australia was far moister and greener. And we now have like relict rainforests, like the Dane tree being an example, and down in Tasmania, the um, temperate rainforests are kind of relict refugia of the paleo-Australian botany, it would have just been a different world mm. back then, replete with giant species of all sorts of stuff. Nowadays, Australians, we've grown up not appreciating being part of a, an ecosystem with megafauna. Yeah, yeah. I remember going to the US, so the first time I went for a bushwalk in the mountains behind San Diego, and there was this sign that said, what to do in the event of a mountain lion attack. And I thought to myself, fuck me, I would happily trade having to bang my Ugg boots out every time I put them on in case there's a red back in it, then having to be potentially being hunted when I'm going for a bushwalk. I tell you what, though, you know? I've spent a bit of time in Africa and Zimbabwe is a great place. You want to experience megafauna because it's a poor country and the parks there are just very open. You camp anywhere and, and it's a very nervous experience when you're sitting actually at your phone literally my own daughters within a meter behind them there's a pack of hyenas just sitting looking at you mm. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not kidding a meter away <laughs> so it's a, I might sort of at that point trade the red back yeah but but your general point's right I don't Australians don't realize that Australia once had all the big animals that Africa's got you know we, but we had marsupial yeah. equivalents yeah and thought like a layer like so yeah. a big lion possum lion and yeah, can you imagine Australia being roamed by these giant animals if they're still here today? Blame your mind. Well, the US was the same. I went yeah. to the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles you know, with a big mural on the wall there. And that looked like a different version of Africa with the American lion, the American cheetah, the dire wolves, the bloody ground sloth, mastodon, yeah. the mammoth. So, you know, that's Pleistocene ecology for yeah. you. You had this mammalian megafauna and Africa being the last refugia for that on the planet. Mm. One Australian species that I don't have a lot of enough airtime was the Quincana. You know that chap? No. When humans arrived in Australia, there was the Megalania, the giant Komodo dragon relative. Yeah, big lizard. I thought you might have been there. Yeah, but the Quincana was the last example of what once was a, a more widespread lineage of terrestrial crocodilians. Oh, the crocodiles, yeah, yeah. With big, yeah, yeah. The land crocodile yeah. ran around with its legs underneath it. Enormous. Terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever looked into the cow swamp site? Um, yes. I mean, it's a bit mysterious, cow swamp. Yeah, but it's yeah. mysterious because, yeah, it is because it could be archaic humans, one, one view. Mm -hmm. It could be head bound humans. Right. It could be some kind of diseased skulls. I was just happened to be president of the Archaeological Association at that time. Right. And John Mulvaney and I. Um, mm. Had meetings with the with the with the people from that was you know, from that area, the contemporary descendants, of, and discussing the return of the cow swamp remains, which did get returned, as it turned out, and um, they've destroyed. So you, we're never going to know about that. Yeah. So it's, it remains mysterious.
I don't know how I feel about the repatriation thing. I, I have a foot in both camps and I have not made up my mind. Yeah, yeah. Cow Swamp is a really interesting site. Yeah, yeah. Is it Victoria or New South Wales? Yeah, Victoria. Victoria. Yeah. It was like a swampy site on what is now farmland and they excavated numerous skeletons from across several thousand years that seemed to be a continued site of use of at least burial usage. The cranium of these individuals show really interesting traits, some with some quite robust features, but also elongated skulls, which is another thing, apart, an area of mine that I find really, really interesting because there is the binding. We know that there are, there are cultures that bind, but there are also, like when you bind a skull from birth, you can change the shape of the skull of the individual, but you don't change the cranial capacity, right? Volume doesn't shift. It's just the size. Uh, sorry, just the shape, not the size. But there are skulls from like the Paracas in South America, numerous of them, where it's not just the shape of the skull that's changed, it's the size, it's the cranial capacity is actually shifted. And the sinuses and the uh, sutures are they're quite different. That's another little Indiana Jones archaeological mystery that I find fascinating. So the cow swamp, that got repatriated, so we didn't extract a whole lot of data from that? We only know what we know when it when it was to the extent research got by the mid 80s, that's as far as it got, then we can speculate forever. Right. But the interesting thing about Cow Swamp, by memory, was dated to somewhere between 12 and 18,000 years. So it's quite a recent, they're quite recent remains. But then we also now know, which we didn't know then, that the half life of carbon's a little more, what's the words, um, shorter than we thought. So a lot of those date sites that were dated to that sort of range, once they were done with an optically stimulated, luminescence they be, we've discovered they're a lot older i, I work with bird alum and animal plane to try and perfect that technique in the early days and um, yeah. we, we we did sort of systematic parallel dating with carbon from data sites with our cell techniques and once you got to at least 30 for sure they, they diverged enormously so whereas carbon stopped at 30 35 the, the osl dates went on to 45 and 50 Hence, hence the, the older right. dates that we've got now. So who knows actually how old Kale Swamp was. It could well have been a 30,000, 40,000-year-old site. You know, Because we used to think Mungo was 28, 32,000 years, then it got dated with OSL and it became 45, 50. Well, it, there has, I mean, even in my lifetime, as I've been paying attention to this, there is a slow pushing back of the date. Yeah, yeah. We're sitting now where? Still around the 60, 65,000 years? 65, yeah. People accept people 65 okay. now. Yeah. Okay. How surprised would you be if in the next decade there was conclusive evidence that it was 75, 80? I'm really surprised. Would you be surprised? Yeah, yeah, I don't think. You would be? Yeah, I actually do think that the people that arrived here are pretty much on mass in there, you know, a few thousand people at some point. Probably, I actually mm. think it was a consequence, a response to Lake Tober explosion. Tober. Yeah, but that's my personal view. But so I don't think it'll go beyond 70 but oh, that's just like you have a get you have a feel about it and you've got one and i've got one but that's what i, I think that was the motive of that that was a game changer i'm agnostic yeah i don't know still the out of africa theory it's still that modern sapiens left africa in one migratory wave somewhere around 70 to seventy five thousand years ago well if if the, if the lake toba options considered it means that after that explosion humans almost became extinct when there were only yeah. estimated 6,000 breeding females left alive. I mean, there was a, a basically an atomic winter, which went for a thousand years after that explosion. So that obviously destroyed photosynthesis, destroyed plants, destroyed food, and just almost destroyed yeah. human beings. That's that theory. And then, and then, and then the, those people survived in Africa. And then at 70,000 years, basically those that survived gave rise to Homo sapiens as we understand them. And, and, and so I think. I mean, my personal view is that the people were sitting downwind of it. In other words, this side of Indonesia, Flores, you know, probably came to Australia to get out of there. That's For those who aren't familiar, can you explain really briefly what Lake Toba, the Lake Toba is? Okay, so Lake Toba is literally a lake now in Sumatra, but I, I can't remember exactly the, the, the size of it. But I think when it exploded as a volcano, it just blew. Fucking uh, huge. Yeah, it was half the size of Tasmania went up in the sky. Yeah. And it, and it was, I, look, it was 1,500 times bigger than any nuclear device we've got um, 
it, it sent a dust cloud out, which which went to the south. It, it went to the northwest. The trade winds are still the same as today, but it covered the Indian subcontinent, Malaysia, that peninsula there, through two meters of sediment. I, mean, I think I think Pompeii was something that covered. Yeah, you know, there's even sediment from its explosion in ice cores in Greenland. It was just massive. It must have sent a tidal wave, which is beyond comparison. Mm. Around the um, globe, so and 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 once that uh, once the dust volcanic dust got into the air, it obviously it it, it blocked out the sun. So you they spent this is one model, right? Yeah. The next thousand years, at least, in basically the light never got stronger than a full moon light. Right. And at that point, it caused almost the near extinction of humankind. But there was a small group that lived, continued to survive, probably in Africa, who then expanded out, and that came with it. Um, modern humans. They were modern humans. Jeez. I sort of summarised that at the start of the book. That's my view. Yeah. But but it sounds totally complete. If you're not familiar with it, it sounds farcical. Incredible event. Immense event. Like, almost, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. It's absolutely beyond imagination. Like, it's like it, make, it makes the Arche... Tidal wave, which killed 250,000 people in a blink of an eye, looked like a little kind of rip. Mm. But um, so it's hard to imagine, mm. but, it, but it happened. And whatever the scale was, it happened nonetheless. I'm just curious that it's not yeah. a very well known event. It is curious that it's not that well known. Yeah. It's quite fringe. And you don't know who knows how, who knows what the impact really was. So you don't want to sound like a crazy person. Oh, I'm used to that. <laughs> you know? Until how recently did Australia continue to have semi nomadic people living traditionally on the land? Well, I mean, the last nomads that I knew that had had, well, they had a little bit of contact and went back out in the bush, and some probably never came out, was probably 2002. And I, I was out in the desert last year with helicopters doing other work, but specifically looking for any. Um, traces of those same people but and we normally we, that's more recent than i would have expected yeah, yeah well, no one knows it was always i mean people came out in the 1980s yeah and i've been out with them after that in the early 90s looking for family members which we found tracks and camps but people didn't want to come in and and i've been back out in that country on and off back out in the 2000s and we saw an old humpians a, a, a camel had just been killed not long ago and they'd taken the leg and so there's certainly i mean the the bush people up in the north and the remote deserts always knew they were there, but they just kind of kept it quiet, you know, let it be. Right. So, we, so certainly we know in 2000, even 2004 still, but I'm um, not, not, um, but I don't think now. They, I think they've died. Yeah, it's over. Yeah, okay. That's incredibly sad. It's a hard swallow for anyone, but as a European Australian, just an Australian, some, a human being living on this land, it's something that it's taking me a long time to kind of integrate and accept what's occurred on this continent. Some of the world's oldest continued cultures kind of snuffed out in a relative blink of the eye and uh, what they represent. Yeah, but it, it, look, that's true. But, but don't, I mean, I, I, I you know, have my own responsibilities like you do, but, but, um, but equally, this, the other side of the coin is that there's still a really rich and vibrant traditional Aboriginal culture in the desert, which, you know, as we speak, there are ceremonies, initiation ceremonies literally going on, which are secret and yeah. massive and, and, and amount to, in my opinion, the largest religious um, ceremonial events on earth, but people travel thousands of kilometres to participate in initiation ceremonies. It's all done in secret. And there's almost not a single white person in Australia knows at this moment these traditional Western desert initiation ceremonies are underway. Well, you know, we always hear. Oh wow! Well, uh, yeah, no one. Knows. I'm very, very pleasantly surprised to hear. Well, they're that. underway now. And glad and happy for it to continue in secret. But, you know, yeah, but it's a secret. You get invited into it. Um, the desert, not so much now, but in the past, up and like in my lifetime, would be shut down. Roads are closed. No one can even enter the massive. It was an area the size of Europe. This plays out over, and no one knows in Australia. It happens, man. We do lots of welcome to country sort of ceremonies, but no one knows it actually happens. Yeah. Yeah? Go figure that. Well, I'm really happy to hear that. Mm.
you look at the vastness of Australia, and I remember there was a moment a few years ago where I um, flew from Perth to Brisbane during the day, so, you know, straight over the guts. And I, I was looking down over the landscape, which I'd looked over many times before on other flights, where, and beforehand there was nothing. Now, well then, not the entirety of the landscape, but enough of it, you're up seriously high, however many thousands of feet looking down, you're covering some serious ground. And seeing the grid lines of mining exploration going out across what was beforehand a landscape that may not have ever seen a European footprint on it ever in certain parts here and there. I would be shocked but not surprised to discover that there could be peoples living out there secretively in more traditional means. Um, I like the idea of it. I don't know if it is occurring now. Well, I mean, one of the ironies of that scenario is that even though it's sort of ugly to see seismic lines and although they make them very small now and other mining tracks and stuff, it's the very things that let people get back out on the country because the desert is a hard place and it's hard to travel through. Yeah. Even with the nice air condition fall drives, it's murderously difficult. So there's a, there's a lot of upside there. People can get out in the bush and they do all the time. I was up around Tom Price up through the Kimberley a couple of months ago and driving, for, where was it? I think driving from Tom Price to Exmouth through the guts there and I mean that's not even the harshest of it but no. by God stepping outside of the vehicle I just thought to myself holy shit yeah would humans have no. it this is crazy it's so so severe yeah exactly right I often say to people you can't imagine what it's like I've done a lot of, had the fortune misfortune doing a lot of field work out in the middle of the desert in the summer and and you only have to go through a couple of 56 degree days I'm you know mm. you actually can't kneel on the ground to change the flat the flat tire it's so hot and you think you could cook an egg on it. Well, you totally don't hold your bull bar like it's black and it's hot as, yeah. you know, and, and it's cliche, but it's hot. Yeah. And you just imagine that for months and months and months and months with tiny bits of water. Very difficult. Mm. Have you ever heard anything about giant spirals, giant petroglyph spirals on the ground throughout the Australian mainland? No, no. Go on, you explain. Well, I don't know if I'll even put this in the finished version. Yeah. Let me show you something. Okay, let me share my screen. You can see my Google Earth screen? Yeah. Check this out. This is Ord River, right? This is the scale. We're zooming into Ord River. Mm -hmm. See those spirals? Dear valued listener, the Oak Terrain Tree team would like to invite you to sit back, relax, close your eyes, and imagine some giant spirals. Thank you. They're not concentric circles, they're spirals. See these? Yeah, I can see them. Um, That's a big space, and this is just one area. So now we'll zoom way back down here to near Alice Springs. See these things? And down here, there's one here. There's another one up here. And I mean, it goes on and on. I can bounce all over the place. Here's some just outside of Alice Springs again. Have you, have you ever heard anything about that? No, but they're, I mean, they're incredible looking. They're obviously, they're obviously artificial because I was going to say at first it's just the residual elements of a differential erosion up in the old river. But yeah, but no, I can see, I can totally see that they're there. I mean, that would be a good research topic for you. I'm sort of surprised no one's in research. The first I've heard of it. Oh. Well, I think it's fascinating. I mean, you've got to start with the assumption that someone's gone out there and done it with a tractor. But but I'll say this. That's right. That's you right. Know, they mightn't have, right? And and you know the one of the weirdest things? It's not weird at all. In fact, it's something sensible. I've and it's a cliche, you know, people say things like Aboriginal people are always so good in the bush. But unless you've done a lot of time mm. time in the bush with Traditional people, you ca you can't appreciate how good their iconographic mind is. White people don't have it. So I can drive, for example, and it will come back to circles because part of the part of the difficulty is conceptualising that people can have a a topographic view of landscape to produce artificially those perfect circles unless they're doing it with a GPS or something, right? But but I will say so when I've been in the bush with traditional people, I've literally been driving north south and they'll say to me oh we had 
we had lunch over that sand dune. And I'm going like, when? And they and they're a long time ago. And then of course they're talking about somewhat something five years ago. Right. And we traveled from a completely different direction, stopped for an hour and took off. And yeah, you know, I come back five years later, they come in yeah. a completely different direction from the wrong side of the journey and can tell me where the, the lunch stop is. So that capacity of hunter-gatherers, traditional people, to actually visualize and lock into their head exactly the nature of the topography is pretty out there. Have you come across Lynn Kelly's work with the memory code? No. Okay. Author Lynn Kelly, who was exploring the idea of these mnemonic mind mapping techniques and song lines, the Indigenous Australians singing their way through country. Yeah. As a, like a, amongst many other things, it's not just this, but a memory device to be able to lock in a multidimensional spatial map in one's head to be able to sing themselves through and navigate their estate through country. And this chap, Mark Jones, they're making a film at the moment called Stories in Stone, mm -hmm. which is based on that, the idea of human ritual and many megalithic sites like Stonehenge and others as physical re representations of memory coding techniques. I'm familiar with what you're talking about now. I didn't know what you meant. I mean, it's most likely, given the sort of, again, it goes to sort of paleoanthropology, that, that, that humans or our ancient ancestors 800,000 years ago sung to each other before we spoke to each other, yeah? Like birds, right? We sung. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, and you can tell that because of the nature of the, the lower cranial areas where the, the sort of the, the neural pathways are going through haven't changed, they haven't evolved, the head shape has changed, but they stayed the same. So we sang to each other. Hence, hence we um, remember things better if they're in song. Whenever we hear a song we haven't heard for 20 years, we can remember it. If we're speaking to someone who can't speak English very well, like a baby, we put on a sing-song voice. So that's that's a, a human condition. Ah, uh, yeah, you do. I've never th I've never thought about that. Yeah, you've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? Yeah. That's what we do. We sniff. So we, so for, for the, our archaic consciousness, as a as just not an indigenous thing, as a human species, is music is is primal. Hence. We can watch a movie, and as soon as we get a certain kind of code of music, we know it's going to be scary. Yeah, right. We don't need. You can almost do a movie without words, and know the story by the by the song. The emotional tone is all controlled by the the song, the music. Isn't by it? the music, yeah. It's we're obsessed with music. It's a universal language. We still say that, and it dates back at least eight hundred yeah. thousand years. We've always sung to each I, other. We've barely begun to crack the code of what music is and can be. And in, in, speaking of can be, I think the industrialized mind we've forgotten the depth and breadth of what we can be as a species and what we can actually hold in ourselves. The concept of these mind maps in search of a better term, the likes of which that my mate Mark is exploring in this movie, Stories in Stone, it's incredible. I mean, nowadays, and I spoke about this with Mark, he, has, he was actually a guest on my podcast. We spoke about how we export so many of our faculties off to these things mm. now. It's a prosthetic limb, that mind. It's a pros prosthetic mind. Yeah. Yeah. And once once upon a time, we didn't have those things and, we, and you lived in a world where risk was real and survival was real and you needed to be able to transmit information not, a, not only to the people immediately within proximity to you spatially and temporally, but you needed to be able to transmit information as far down the lineage family line as you could possibly could and be able to, to exchange information with people who maybe lived on the bordering country to you or what have you. There's a vast heritage of memory systems that we might now call you know, mythology and mnemonics and song and ritual and ceremony and megalithic structure and all these things combined that we, we've forgotten the purpose of. Industrialised culture, we've forgotten how genius the human being can be to adapt to challenge, a challenge like that, and the universe of data that we can maintain and transmit and rant. Yeah, but look, you're, uh, you're right, and, and we, we totally forget. Look, the, the Iliad, which is the first, notion of the first Western novel, it's over 80,000 words, and it, what it is, he was the guy that did that, whoever that was, that wrote it, just chose to write down the stories that travelling Greeks would say and speak in public, it's public theatre. 
and there's an 80,000 word, and if you try and read it, it's hard to read, let alone actually. It was, it was all done by recall. And in, in Shakespeare's time, when Shakespeare himself was performing his own plays that he was writing, they couldn't afford paper. There was no paper in those days. It was done on parchment. It was all done by memory. They would perform those plays five or six times a week. Yeah. And who do you know that can memorise a complete play of Shakespeare? So, we, yeah, we've, ter- we've certainly sacrificed a lot of memory retention for convenience, like who can remember a phone number now? I used to be able to remember a dozen phone numbers. So that's right. Yeah, so. I, something that I've, I've discovered with memory, to have a, a system is a really important thing, right? So like I'm a bit of a botanophile. I, I love the world of plants. In fact, ethnobotany was another direction I was going to go down, but that's a different story. I always had a capacity to retain the name of, of a plant. Mm. But it wasn't until I learned the system of binomial nomenclature that we use now and the way that we structure the taxonomic structure of relationship in the biological kingdom. Once I received that system into my head, it was like a filing cabinet into which I could place yeah, the other were codes. They, yeah, there were codes and connections because you know, we, we think in relative terms. Yeah. It really helped. This is this is what I think we don't appreciate in the industrialized world. It was the codes, the systems, not just the capacity to retain, but the system. Because it's an invisible human heritage, you know, we, we get very upset and rightfully so when we think about like the extinction of a species, because that's a tangible, visible thing. We get upset even when we see once traditional recently traditional peoples having to you know acquiesce into industrialized culture but the loss of those invisible human cultural systems structures those codes real loss yeah huge loss languages ways of thinking and that actual frameworks of thinking sciences yeah but, but there's a complete irony, isn't there? Because you do lose those codes. No one can re- remember a full Shakespeare play without a prompt. But, you know, we do end up with Google and we can sort of tap into it and ask what were Shakespeare's main plays and there they are ready for us. So now we can do a podcast. So it's a real dilemma. Best of both worlds, ideally. But um, Correct. I won't hold you too much longer, Scott. But uh, speaking of plants before, are you something that hasn't been exported much into the kind of popular conversation is Australian Indigenous Australian ethnobotany mm. like around the world like if one was to go into a herbalism course it would be mainly European there'd be a lot of North American influence a lot of Asian Eurasian African South American a little bit more and more South American but Australian you don't see in that conversation so much and there are some obvious reasons for that. But even as someone who's really interested in this, the Australian, eth- Indigenous Australian ethnobotany is something that hasn't trickled down into like mainstream discussion. Are you aware of if and where and when the use of psychoactive plant materials existed in Indigenous cultures in Australia? Um, yeah. The, um, so two quick answers. I wrote a lot about ethnobotany in the 1980s and published some extensive um papers on that, on the on, on all the foods that could be eaten in the whole desert. Right. And I broke them down into the calorific intake and the collection time so I can get a sense of what people ate, including medicines and right. and, and whatever else. So you could find those online probably. But then I stopped because I was a bit of a lone, a lone researcher. It okay. wasn't a thing. And of course now indigenous foods and you know the premium additions to menus. In terms of the um the I mean the t- native tobacco is obviously just a straight nicotinia so they're not so much, but the, right. the, true tobacco. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot, there's a lot of native tobaccos, but but the the pituri, the sort of the one that's in South Australia, which was traded massively, has a. It's not really. I mean, I've used it. It's not really hallucinogenic. It's like a kind of bad stone. It's a bit sort of muddle-headed, but that's the only one that I know of that was actually had a hallucinogenic, or at least a. Okay. I don't know what the word is. A sort of trippy sort of yeah, psychoactive. It, it would kill you. Know, had a, it was a very strong form of nicotinia, in fact. But that's quite well written about. You'd be able to find out a lot about that, and it's been more well analysed and so forth. But it's you know it comes from a it comes from a plant which is only in a very small grove. I think it's less than 120 uh, hectares, and that's the that's the resource. So it was a highly valued product in the old days. 
you suspect that like the pushing underground of or outright extinction of knowledge that there would have been a far greater psychoactive ethnobotanical toolkit amongst the indigenous australians all across the continent no i reckon i reckon well no, i don't think so I, I think what is likely to have been there's probably known like the alcohol that the tasmanian aboriginal people used to make right from, um from the cider gum and they fermented that purposefully. So I think <clears throat> it will probably be recorded. I certainly know I haven't missed anything because in my own desert experience, I was out with people or they were first contact people. Mm. Okay. I don't know. I would have suspected there'd be a lot more usage than we... Uh... I don't reckon there was many trippy drugs like you know mescaline and stuff in Australia. No? I kind of was mindful of it, being a surfer and so right. forth. <laughs> but there, and there was no reason because they don't kind of like... In bush, they don't kind of have the middle class norms we do they're not going to say oh we can't tell you about that because it's a drug like there yeah let's take more of it right you know? so it wouldn't have been taboo it wouldn't have been hidden no, is that what you're saying no, okay no. interesting yeah. all right i'll chew on that Looks okay in my personal experience i'm absolutely sure okay all right that's cool last question i'll let you go and this is one that indulges a very novel interest of mine have you heard from indigenous mob much if anything about the hairy man war oh endlessly everywhere True. There's nowhere I have been in the, from the most urban, the oldest mission sites in New South Wales, where people, you know, so-called, you know, quite modernised, mm -hmm. through to Port Lincoln, where I live here. I was talking to school kids who came out a while back, just like a month ago for a chat, and yeah. to the desert. Less so in the desert, I've got to say, but not everywhere. Yeah. Really? Yeah, always. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Because I'm very curious about it. Do you think it's just archetypical? Um, it's a little bit. It's a little bit um, protective, probably. Be careful, otherwise the hairy man will get you. It's like, or the gadaicha man will get you. There's an element of that. But I, I, I mean, we're probably, boogie man. Yeah, a bit boogie manish. But 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 so I know a lot of people have absolutely po positively seen them. But I think that is. This will sound completely romantic and yeah. And unlikely. I just think Aboriginal people, mm -hmm. as a, and I overgeneralise, so I, I say it with some qualification, I, whatever that yeah. means. Aboriginal people are also different. I just think they've got a receptivity to spiritual things yes. that we've lost. Right. I've, it's happened to me too many times in the bush. I've been in the bush when people are pointing at spirits, yeah. describing them to me. I can't see them. I've seen right. them on one occasion right. about that in a, in, a, in, a, in a previous book, to First Footprints. Right. I've had the experience once. And um, so I just think they, they're they tapping into something we don't tap into. That's very interesting. And I think it goes back to your point about industrialisation. We've sort of, too much TV, man. We've lost our natural capacity to be, quote, in tune with well, our I, I think we've lost a psychic capacity. Frankly, I think there is a there is a faculty there. I know exactly. What you mean. Um, the sensitivity to what's actually around. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and I think there is a there is a non tangible ecology of things out there that we just haven't mapped, and God knows what the sensitive individual or collective can pick up on. I mean, I stopped doing I stopped doing archaeology after this experience in the desert, which I won't recount now. But it's, I wrote about in a book called Pilamuru, P I L A N G U R U, which is hard to get now. And it's expensive right. on Amazon. But I'll, I'll try to find it because I'm bloody, you've piqued my curiosity now. Giacomo, your friend might have a copy somewhere. But I, I, I write about that and I thought I'd be brave here and actually describe my experience because I could not explain my experience. Yeah? Right. And I'm a rational scientific archaeologist at this point. But it was sufficiently strong for me to stop doing archaeology. I thought I'm not digging any more sites. I'm not going to record. I'm not picking up artifacts. And I stopped. And I've never done it since. Hence, writing first. Really, it was that experience that. Yeah, it was really distressing. I still can't explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, it was that experience. Jeez, distressing. Okay. My curiosity levels are like gone through the roof you know. now. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Scott, thank you so much. Yeah, good to chat. I'll leave you to it, mate. I really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Hey, I enjoyed mate. it. And if you ever come to Southwestern Australia for whatever reason, let me know and me and Jarkham will take you out for a meal and take you down south and go for a surf. Unreal. Have a look at some sinkholes. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, mate. Thanks. thanks. Nice to chat. Yeah, likewise. All the best. See you later, mate. Cheers. Things I think you already know Got a party, got a soul Leaking in for like a day Rolling eyes on by the way
dragon 